Hi there, and welcome back to Eggs. This week's special guest is founder of BombTech Golf, Tyler Sullivan. BombTech is an e-commerce store with more than 20 million in online sales. With his experience, he also runs Ecom Growers, a company whose mission is to help Shopify owners add six to seven figures to their e-commerce stores through optimizing email systems and ad campaigns, as well as uncovering hidden revenue streams. Joining us today for a conversation about customer experience in e-commerce stores, operating a lean business that drives profit, and so much more. Please join me in welcoming to the show, Tyler Sullivan. Hey, Tyler, how are you? Welcome to the show. Yo, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Yeah. Thrilled, thrilled to do it. So I guess let's kind of start from the beginning. Let's talk a little about who you are, where you're from, and what you do. What do I do? Um, not much anymore. No, so <laughs> I'm, I'm the founder of BombTech Golf and also co-founder of Ecom Growers. BombTech, we kind of was an accidental entrepreneurship moment for me. I started in 2012, uh, was fired from my day job in 2013. And we sell premium uh, golf clubs, direct consumer before direct consumer was kind of a thing. You know, we were kind of the first and use Facebook and uh, Instagram ads to scale that up. Uh, I think, you know, we do about 10 million a year right now. I work about four hours a week on that, really have nothing left to do. Uh, so I started another company, uh, Ecom Growers, with my first employee at BombTech. Um, and we help other e-com brands that are doing at least a million a year with their email. We've got about 40 clients. And uh, right now I'm playing lots of golf, a lot of fishing, spend most time with my kids. My wife has kicked me out of the house to go to an office. I'm home too much. Uh, <laughs> but it wasn't always the case. You know, I, I was working 20 hours a day, seven days a week. I did that for four years, really hustled and grind and did a lot of things wrong. Um, but getting fired was the, uh, I guess, the pressure I needed and kicking the ass to to go full time. And then I was able to scale it up and, you know, life's good now. But it wasn't, it wasn't always the case. Well, that's a, you're quite literally taking the four hour work week to heart. And I, I like that. <laughs> well, um, I just delegated it all out. Now I, I, I literally am not allowed to open the computer because I screw shit up. So it's, uh, <laughs> the only reason I open the computer now is to do podcasts, really. So. Nice. Um, so can you tell us about the early days of bomb tech? Um, did you start off with your own product or did you were you wholesaling other products to begin with? And then I noticed that you, um, have your own product line and maybe tell us a little bit about the R and D of developing the first driver. Yeah. So when I started, e-com was not a thing really. It was like becoming a thing, but Shopify wasn't even really legit yet. Websites were hard to make. Um, so I was really starting out of pure passion. Like I had no expectations of making a single dollar. I was attempting to compete in the uh, home run derby of golf world long drive. And in doing so, I had all these really odd golf drivers made, like really weird lengths, a uh, lot low loss, extra stiff shafts. And it was a local club builder that was building for me. And I was just trying to get an advantage and hit it farther and um in doing so i broke like all the clubs that were built and i just started assembling my own uh you know and again i wasn't like manufacturing yet um and it, it was just all for fun i didn't think i'd sell any i was just doing it because i was trying to compete it was something i enjoyed um and then for some reason i made a website and it was like the world's worst website and i posted up some clubs on there didn't sell anything for like six months. Didn't really do anything with it. It was just tooling around, you know, just really no, no, no vision, just having fun, um, hitting balls as hard as I could. And then as like my first epiphany, I was on a boat, not a yacht. It was just this boat we had on, on Lake Champlain with my wife and I got an email and that email was my first sale. And that just blew my mind. I was like, holy shit, I just made money on a boat. I wasn't out of work. I wasn't in front of a computer. And it was really the first epiphany. And I, I'm very basic. You know, I, whenever I see traction, I just go that way. And that was the first moment of like, okay, let's do more of that. So I sold a couple more. And then I was drinking beers with a buddy from college, uh, one of my frat brothers. And I'm like, dude, I kind of want to design my own golf club. He's like, well, you're not that smart. <laughs> And I'm like, well, you're not wrong. It did take me five years to graduate. 
uh, four, four and a half, and I still lived in the frat house for the extra half year. So I think <laughs> I'm smarter than him because I skied every day and waited tables at night and still lived at, at college, you know. So so I think I actually am the smarter of the two. But um, so I worked with my local college, UVM, where I barely graduated with uh, four students. And we engineered a driver. And it was, again, like a lot of my success had no timeline and like no expectations. I'm just like, hey, I'm going to make a driver. I didn't know if I was going to sell any. Um, and then when we designed one, I said, oh, shit, I got to make it. Uh, so I cashed in my 401k. Probably not a smart move at the time. Well, it was smart, but it wasn't seemingly smart at the time. And I made like the tooling and like, I think it was like 50 drivers. And throughout that process for that year of designing, I was just documenting what I was doing on Facebook. And this is 2012. So this is a different time. Um, and I sold, when we actually went to launch it, I had like a tiny email list, Facebook group of like our uh, Facebook uh, page of like 800 people, maybe a thousand. We'd, we'd buy likes back then. <laughs> That's what you'd pay for. Um, and I think I sold like 10 grand worth of product, which I think was all my drivers I had. And it was all on pre-order. And I was like, okay, let's do more of that. And, and that year was really, that was a tough year because I had some traction, but didn't have much scale, you know? So I think we did like a hundred grand of my own product, thought there was something there. And really it was the moment when we started do messing around with Facebook video and Facebook ads. And so I, I did get it up to, I think 500 K organically, which was really hard to do. Um, and then I made a video in my backyard when Facebook video first came out, boosted it for 300 bucks. And it's me hitting a ball into a net and it sounds like a gun goes off. And I say, what does your driver sound like? And that video got 300,000 views, 10,000 comments. And I boosted oh. for 300 bucks. So all I did back then, I had a Blackberry, if you can imagine that. <laughs> and I literally commented until my thumbs were bleeding. And I commented on every single comment. And really that was the foundation of building an audience and engaging with that audience. And I, I, I think I did it because I was just like, I, I didn't know what was going to happen. I was just like amazed that people would comment back. So it wasn't like I would comment and someone would buy a club. You know what I mean? That's what I hoped would happen, but I didn't know what was going to happen. So, so the engagement was there. And then I started running ads poorly myself, got over to over a million dollars. That next year, hired some people, got it to four million, six million. Now we do like 10 million a year um, with two employees. Um, and really... You know, now I now I work less than ever because I've delegated everything off. But but there's there's a lot of epiphanies in that moment. But really, it was just using Facebook and engaging, um, and and actually taking the time to talk to customers. Yeah, I love that. Um, I mean, there's a million things to unpack in there. Uh, first thing I wanted to ask, though, like I mean, prior to starting into like an e-commerce journey. Did you have any like relevant work experience doing this? You mentioned before you were working 20 hours a day. I mean, were you working for, e you know, on an e-commerce platform for some other company or something? Or, no, no. Uh, so oh. like this was totally out of left field, no experience in it. I was in sales, um, had no experience with e-com at all. Just threw up a website, enjoyed it. And that, and I was working 20 hours a day doing the e-com thing and really, take a step back when I went from the 400 K to uh, 1.2 million, I was fired from my day job uh, the week before Thanksgiving when I found out my wife was pregnant. Oh, of course. Yeah. So that was the pivotal <laughs> moment that allowed me to work 20 hours a day. Uh, and that was probably the hardest year of my life was because I was, I didn't know what I was doing. Therefore I was working 20 hours a day to figure it out. A 18 hours of that was assembling clubs, shipping clubs, doing the stuff. And then, you know, two hours consuming and trying to figure it out. Um, but there's a, a lot of me doing the wrong stuff that you have to do to get good enough at those things. Uh, but yeah, no, no relevant work experience, just 
just a guy on a, on a mission, I guess. Well, I love that. I think it's inspiring for people who don't have any experience, you know, because I think for a lot of people, the world of e-commerce, especially, you know, sh- building a website on Shopify or whatever, like all these seem like wildly technical things to be doing, right? So, you know, it, it would make sense. Oh, okay, well, you've been doing this for years, you know, so it wasn't that that foreign for you. But I think it's inspiring for people to hear that that wasn't the case for you. You know, actually you came in and you literally stumbled through it. So I, I think that's really and, and it was much harder back then. Like today, it's so much easier to pop up a site back then i had a i had a, a web designer on retainer with like no sales because it was that hard to tweak a website in 2012 you couldn't just like make it look good uh out of the box so so it's a very different time um today it's like so much easier but it's also more competitive so it's a it, you know there's always the grass was greener but it was it was technically more difficult to get going back then but less people were doing it you know sure. The other thing I wanted to pick out of that little bit of uh, information you gave us was the idea of delegation, right? So I think, you know, this is something I struggle with. I think a lot of people struggle with the idea of being able to hand off some stuff or be able to replace yourself, right? And so I wonder, you know, if there's anything you could contribute or anything you might comment on as it, as it pertains to de- uh, delegation, like when to know is the right time, you know, how to find talent, you know, all these sorts of things, because I think there's you know, possibility for people to delegate when they shouldn't delegate. And then there's also time that they should be delegating. And, and so, you know, so maybe you can help, uh, you know, give us a little clarity around when's the time to delegate. Yeah, I think it's unique for every person. Uh, for me, it was my second child that made me delegate. I, I when I had my daughter, you know, I'd been working a ton sales were, you know, north of like 6 million. And I was like, what am I doing in the office every day? And, you know, so I said, Hey, I'm, I'm really not that smart. I'm going to delegate even my last task and take six weeks off. And I took the six weeks off and sales went up. And that made me realize, okay, I really am not that important and I have the right people, but it's more of a ego um, control thing than a, and a timing thing than people realize. And like, for me, that was the hardest part is realizing that people can do it probably better than I could because you started it, you founded it, you built it, you want to control it. And I think strangling the business is probably when you do have some level of success is, is this the hardest part. Like getting to the first million is the first level. Like you get to it. Can you get to a million on your own? I think anyone, it is possible. Like I got to a million with no employees. And then I started delegating customer service, basic stuff that I just couldn't handle anymore. But to get to the next point, you got to start really letting go and only pulling big levers. And I think that's what, again, like I, you could have told me this stuff back when I was doing it. I would say, screw you. No one can do it like I can. Um, but it was my second kid. That was my life event that made me do it to realize I'm not the guy that needs to be doing the doing. Right. And I think that's the hardest thing. And so for me, a lot of days I get, it's kind of, it's, I'm on the other side now where it's like, I get frustrated because I don't even know what's going on day to day, um, nor should I. And if I do, I screw it up. So it's one of those things where I want to work more some days. And I'm like, I don't have any things to do because it's all delegated to experts in every category. But so like to break down the exact process I use and someone could use, first off, you got to know how to do everything yourself to be proficient enough to hire and fire. Like, so that's the deal. You got to know enough in Facebook ads, shipping, manufacturing, email marketing, uh, customer service, CRO, whatever you, you're going to hire for, you have to have done it yourself. Once you've done it yourself, you then can delegate. And I think this is where it's a control thing. And you, if you have a bad experience finding people that suck, then you go back to doing it yourself. So it's just like circle of bullshit <laughs> where it's like you then know you need to hand it off. But then you go to do it and then it's a bad experience and you're like, ah, oh, no one can do it. I'll do it myself. And I, I am definitely have had that happen to me as well. And so what I do now is if I were to do it all over, I didn't do it in this linear way, but I would just write down every bucket that I work on. So Facebook ads would be, or silo, I call it, uh, Facebook ads, email marketing, 3PL or shipping, customer service, CRO. So you have your silo, right? And then the easiest way to do it out of the gate, it's just to make a video of what you're doing already. A Loom video, it can be the worst video you've ever made in your life, just of what you're doing and explaining how you're doing stuff. So I, I would make a, like, this is what I literally did. I would make a video of Facebook ads, 
of me. Hey, I'm making a video about the driver. This is why I'm making it this way. This is what I'm doing. This is what I hope the result is. That's it. And I would just make the videos. How, and then I could either hand that off to someone or try to find someone better. And so my philosophy has been document each silo, but then try to find someone better. So you have like your method of doing shit and then try to find someone that can do it better. So a good example of this is I fired my best ad guy because I lost touch of what was working and it took me 12 months to find someone better. Um, and I had to learn Facebook ads myself for a whole year and I hired and fired 12 agencies in that time. And that was probably the most painful marketing year because we already had the machine running and we took a step back because I, I messed up from a uh, hiring and firing standpoint because I didn't know enough. So can you, maybe, I, go ahead. can you maybe break down what they were doing wrong and what you did differently and figured out over that year? Because obviously it didn't work and you, you tweaked a few things and it started working again. And that's maybe one of those eggs that uh, stand out to. Yeah. Others. I mean, it was pretty simple. It was the copy and creative was, are the levers, you know, they were, you know, their the guy I had before had great copy, great creative, uh, knew how to run ads. And I fired him because I thought we were doing bad, even though it was January is an off season month. And we had like a seven X return ads on, which is sick. Um, but through that year, I just couldn't find anyone to do it. So I ended up taking like a million courses. I actually hired a Facebook ads coach to teach me until the point where he's like, dude, you're better than I am. Um, and I just learned how to write copy and I used, made videos and photos just myself that got engagement and then drove conversions. Um, but to, to the, to vetting. So I took that whole process was super painful, had to buy this massive laptop uh, screen and stuff like two of them. So I could do ads myself. I was like, dude, I don't want to be doing this shit. So I, that was like, a, I took a step back to take a step forward here. And I, I, so now I vet anyone with a one hour screen share. So like for my ad guys, like, dude, I hired and fired all these people. It was a nightmare. I ended up running myself. I'm like, I can't do this forever. If we're going to scale, you know, we need a better guy. So my method is once you have those silos, you document your basic process and then you vet someone better. Right, so it's silo, document, vet. And so from there, I will invite anyone who thinks they can beat me in any category. Not that I'm a guru, or I'm good or whatever, but like on Facebook ads, I was like, dude, I was running like a three, five X. I know people can do better than I could. So I invite them to a screen share. I'd pay them like whatever their hourly rate is. I don't care if it's whatever the number was, I would pay them one hour and I'd invite them to do a head to head ad campaign build. You do your tactics, tricks, creative, whatever the hell you want. You show me though, here's the key. You, you build it, but it's side by side. So my goal was two part. I would learn from them if they had anything to teach me. Um, and then if they beat me, I would hire them. And so I went through all the agencies for the whole year. And then I just slammed through these screen shares until I found the last guy who was like, dude, you, you suck. That's pretty much what he said. <laughs> uh, he's like, I'm gonna do this, this and this, I'm gonna beat you. And then he did this, this, and this, and did beat me. And he's been my ad guy for three and a half years. Um, so really, it's any any category, as long as I know the category, document, and then that's what I do. I do a screen share, and they say, you know, if they're like, hey, we don't do that, I'm like, okay, you don't want the business. Uh, but that at least teaches me and allows me to fast track to find an agency, an expert, or whatever. And now I've got a, you know, an email agency, a CRO agency, an SEO agency, all these different categories that are all outsourced so that I don't have to manage people and deal with day-to-day -day shit, you know? You uh, outsource your customer service as well? No, nope. so that's my only in-house. They have full health insurance paid for, 401k. Um, I try to, they work remote here in Vermont. So my only two employees are customer service. And they're, for customer service, everyone's like, yeah, overseas, two bucks an hour, my guy's got full health benefits um, because that's like, as a golfer, you need to talk to golfers. Right. And yeah. I feel like for me, that's one of the biggest investments I can make is in, in those guys. Um, I will say we do have after hour support that is overseas and that's more of a speed thing. So it's like two in the morning. I'm not going to have a guy to stay up all night locally to do two replies, you know? So it's one of those things where it's just like, Hey, Thanks so much for your reply. I'll send this to our manager, Mike, to hit you on Monday. And that's just more of a automated, like, 
per ticket thing I do to help those guys out. So Monday morning, they're not completely screwed from the weekend. Um, so it's a kind of a balance. That's an agency does that, but majority of like things that need real attention are my in-house guys. So it's a hybrid, I guess. Okay. Um, so what kind of roles then do you hire for? I guess the, the disconnect or the bit that I'm trying to solve in my mind is, you know, from where you're able to step out and somebody's able to basically run the operations, right? I get the version where order gets submitted. It goes to warehouse for fulfillment, like that kind of stuff. But do you have like, I mean, did you outsource an office manager or somebody that's sort of handling, I guess, standing there instead of you? Uh, I have a VA through uh, Belay, which is a US source like VA company. Um, I, I've had a lot of bad direct hiring experiences. So I tend to lean towards outsourcing, you know, even though she's like, she's paid, she's very expensive. Um, she works, I think it's 15 hours a week for me and she deals with all the operations. Uh, she essentially has a, a Monday board with all the different silos, like, you know, accounting, operations, shipping, you know, fulfillment, CRO, like whatever needs approvals. And really what I've done is I've, streamlined everything into a Monday board of like all the agencies, zero email this. And then, and then it, all it is distilled down to approvals where I literally, I go in and make approvals once a week that take me seven minutes. It's like zero test approved, email to go approved. And it's like the whole month, uh, TV ad approved like content. So, and then like all the operations and, and execution of that is my VA. Uh, and she's amazing. Um, but yeah, like it, it's pretty weird because I have had tried to hire people to, and I at one point had like six in-house guys, an office locally, an indoor hitting bay, and sales were the worst. So I, I tend to work with one VA that's like, is an expert at being a VA and doing just tasks. And her skill set is what I call FIO, which is figure it out. <laughs> <And> <laughs> She's truly an expert at that. And I've had a hard time hiring internally where I don't have to train and train and train and they just don't get it. Whereas VAs are used to working remote, used to solving problems. And she'll just like make a Monday board, which is just the, uh, I don't know what you call it, software to help track. So just make it. Yeah. Uh, and she'll just like, okay, here's a problem. Here's my solution. This is what we're going to do. Are you cool? And I'm like, great. So like she'll, she's gone through all of her customs paperwork she's like hey there's a discrepancy of nine dollars and 13 cents i've already taken care of it versus me hand holding um and teaching someone to do that it's it's kind of a unique thing and i thought i could never hand it off um but she kills it so one of the things that um you know say i want to go and start a shopify store and a not a sales platform you have to have a product to begin with and you obviously have a passion in golf and you were able to develop your own drivers. The R and D process of coming up with, you know, this is the club, this, we, we kind of went over it with, you had the students at the college kind of design it, the manufacturing process and getting the product made and shipped and, and delivered. That's, that's a lot of work and getting that kind of figured out and honed in had to be kind of a lot of trial and error to begin with and finding your good manufacturer to go with. Can you maybe talk about that initial process of developing the first clubs, getting the the first batch done? Were there any issues with them? And then, you know, finding the good company to actually manufacture it for you. Are you doing it overseas? Do you do direct ship? Do you have a, a back like a, a thousand clubs in warehouse sitting somewhere that you just ship out yourself? Can you maybe break that like, down like for you? Hundred hundred thousand clubs in warehouse. <laughs> It's, it's painful. I mean, to be honest, that is the, probably the hardest thing, you know, like, so for me, it was pure passion. I was making it to make it regardless of selling it, which seems insane. Um, and I think that's where, like, I was going to start a ski brand, uh, cause I love to ski and a fishing brand cause I love to fish. So it's like, but I didn't want to ruin those sports for me. <laughs> right. It doesn't turn into work, man. So I was like, ah, I love to ski. I don't want, so I have like, I have a, a garage, or not garage, a storage unit of like a hundred pairs of skis that I never brought to market that I've tested. Um, but I did the same thing with golf clubs. You know, we just tested a bunch of different designs, different shafts, different grips, you know, had them made, you know, trial and error. There's a lot of stuff that never make it, makes it to market. Um, finding my manufacturer was super difficult. Um, had, had to pay someone for an intro. 
I think that's the hardest part, you know, is, and there's two, two things. Number one, making a product that has product market fit and then having a story um, and marketing to sell that product. Cause there's definitely designers, engineers out there and, and tinkerers that have great product, but they never sell a single unit. Um, so I think for me, it's like, it was a lot of like just luck and time and effort. You know, it's like all those kind of all happy. If you have time and effort, you have luck. Um, but designing something is hard. You know what I mean? Like I was trying to do it with my wife for her business. And it's like, I actually was like, I don't know if I can help you. It's just, it's taken me so long to do it on my own. And I wasn't passionate about what she was doing. I was struggling. So I, I think you've got to really have a reason. If you want to just make money online, you're screwed out. You're screwed. It's already too late. You're not going to make it because like, once a trend hits, the trend's already passed. It's like, hey, let me go make face masks. Let me go make women's leggings because they're hot. You know what I mean? So like I, I was selling golf clubs when it wasn't trending up. Golf has been trending down for 25 years. Now golf's hot. Go try to make golf club right now. Two years out, you know, to make a product. So it's, it's – I think you need to do what you enjoy and really have a reason to build a product for yourself to then sell it. You know, like if you had some reason to make some sick hat, jacket, footwear, fishing lure, I don't care what it is. If there's something that you think you need and it's not serving, serving you in the market, go ahead. You know, that, but I think trying to make it to monetize it out of the gate is going to make it feel like work from day one. Whereas for me, I could work 20 hours a day, seven days a week because it was, I loved it. I was just doing it, you know, versus like, hey, I got to make this work to feed my family. I think, I think it's tough. So, I mean, I don't have a good resource to say, Hey, go hit up this website and you'll find sick manufacturers. It doesn't work like that. Um, and we've had some stuff made in the U S we have our stuff now made overseas because that's the best where, where location doesn't matter. I, I go to the best place in the world to get it made no matter where it is. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know if that's good advice, but I haven't, <laughs> like when I was trying to find skis, I was just talking to other ski brands and skiers and asked them and I did get some intros, but I didn't think I could make a ski that was better than what was on the market. Therefore I didn't make them. Um, so that's, that's why I've got a whole storage unit of skis that I don't ski on. Um, and I support my buddy who has a ski brand um, and have, have his skis, but I didn't think I could outperform that. Therefore I didn't make it. Yeah. I like that. Um, do you, I mean, I guess then in your, if you were to put on your hat of sort of advisor to other e-com companies, would you say that, I mean, obviously maybe it's not the quickest start, but I mean, would you advise people to choose products you're passionate about and actually go the manufacturing route? Or if you were trying to advise somebody on how to make their e-commerce company, boom, you know, maybe uncover some of these hidden, you know, revenue streams, would it be to, you know, maybe go the wholesale route, you know, pick a product that exists and maybe white label it or something versus going down the manufacturing route? I don't know if I have a suggestion on that, to be honest. Like all the brands we work with on the agency side already have products, product market fit, already doing 2 million plus, and we just own an email. So it's like one service once you already dialed in. But I think that's where you need to figure out for yourself, what do you want to be? I, I think overall, as a business standpoint, it's much harder to wholesale now. Definitely can be done. But for me, it's like, I, I only know what I know. And so like all the brands we work with for the most part, say 80, 85 to 90% are D2C, direct consumer, their own brand. And some are wholesalers, resellers, which is easier to get into 100%. You're like, buried entry is much lower, but you have that. Buried entry is much lower, so more people can do it. And your margins are much tighter. So you don't have as much. So it's hard to build a brand around other people's product. So but you don't have the cash outlay and cash flow struggles that you do when you go to manufacture $5 million worth of golf clubs. And yeah. you got to, you got to go spend that to go make it. Um, so I, I think, I don't know. I think it depends on what you want. Do you want your own product and brand or do you want to sell other people's stuff? Okay. Well, and so you mentioned earlier sort of the importance of, you know, customer service, customer care, all that kind of stuff. And I assume that sort of leads into the way that you guys manage your email uh, marketing campaigns, things like that, to try and, you know, build a, a level of trust and a level of communication with their, you know, the end users of your of your clients that, um, you know, will help drive sales and things like that. Do you mind talking about sort of the role that email marketing can play in customer service? I think for for many it's, you know, kind of impersonal, it's kind of whatever. So I, I wonder if you could sort of talk about the role that it plays. Yeah, I mean, emails are only owned asset. So I mean, really, 
at the end of the day, if I were to sell the business or something or someone would buy it, they're buying that list, you know, that our customer list and our email list. So we, we look at email very differently and we do this for our clients. It's just a conversational two-way streak, you know? So like when I was talking about the, that social post, I got 10,000 comments and a comment and my thumbs are bleeding. We take that same approach with email. So we ask a ton of questions in email. We have like a new towel. Do you want A or B? This towel design or this towel design? We were like, we were going to drop a chipper and a 64 degree wedge. We said, which one do you want? Chipper or 64? And really by using, asking real questions, you want to know the answer to, you actually get real answers that will help you. Which people are like, oh, wow, it's mind blowing. Like instead they're like, I know everything. I'm the owner. I'm going to launch this product. And I've learned the hard way that my ego and what I want doesn't matter. Um, you know, I've had a product launch. I did beer putt, which is uh, beer pong for golf. <laughs> nice. <laughs> As the 2005 frat beer pong champion, 18 games in a row, um, <laughs> I thought beer pot, beer pot would do well, but my audience doesn't drink that much beer and they're older and don't even know what beer pong is. So when I made it, it didn't do well. Um, so that led me to our overall method, which is just two-way conversational email. And that's why we have in-house guys that are in-house that are paid well because their whole job is when someone replies that we actually reply back. And really that allows us to have dialogue that goes on and on forever and ever with these guys. There could be a customer that's been having an ongoing back and forth email with us for five years. So they're like, holy shit, dude, I got the new driver. Hey, I think you're launching this. Like, when does it come out? So it just changes the whole dynamic and allows you that if iOS 14, which a lot of brands are getting hurt with now, can't target as well, you still have that email list that if you couldn't run Facebook ads, you could email and have conversations and still drive revenue, right? So I think the big mistake is just, and, and don't get me wrong, we still use it to drive revenue, but we do it in a conversational manner. Whereas a lot of people are just blasting deal, 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 deal. And then they're like, oh shit, my email list is worth nothing. Um, then you have a harder time doing repeat orders. Um, so really my agency, Ecom Growers, all we do is we help people build an email calendar build out those emails, send those emails and build out flows so that when they get the traffic or they're already scaling traffic, they monetize more on the front end and they make traffic more profitable. It, it's a, it's a hundred percent necessary thing. We just like to do it in a conversational way that engages people. So we've had multiple people on that have talked about email campaigns and you are the first person that I've heard that has the conversational aspect versus the, just the blast or the SEO or this or that, that, um, you know, and I honestly think that's mind blowing. I've never heard that before. And I think, you know, the conversational approach and actually building that relationship with the customer is, is amazing. And it's not just the one time it's a repeat thing. So if you're having that conversation back and forth, they bought your driver, Hey, try this putter, you know, this and that. And, and that to me, it, it's game changer that, that changes the whole dynamic of the conversation, which, which is great. Well, it's also like if you're going to send an email to Ryan, you're like, yo, dude, I'm going to send you a newsletter or am I going to send you a text that says, yo, dude, what's up? So, so it's just like we're trying to also be native to the platforms. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, we'll use some design for sure. But we also do throw in a lot of plain text emails mm -hmm. where it's like native to what you used to get in an inbox versus like a promo where you have to like load the image. And, you know, it does depend on the client. But for me, you know, like that's what I prefer because it gets the engagement. It's just real conversation, man. And like, at the end of the day, the businesses that are good, just good at Facebook ads and aren't a real brand per se and having real conversations are going to have a hard time. Yeah. And, and actually like, I can't tell you how many mailing lists I've signed up for, for like audio engineering or stuff I'm interested in. And I'll get the email. And the first thing I do is swipe left and don't even open it. So mm -hmm. having that, actual conversation with the person i would if someone's actually emailing me asking me a question i would click on it and i the chance that i would read it and reply is a lot higher than if i just see hey learn this why do this or you know like the the well not, yeah. not only that you also go from when you do reply you go from promotions to the inbox yeah. so when your emails are going in the inbox you've won so that it's also because we do want to actually get them to reply because we want to know what they want to say but you're also, it's a, it also is a tactic to get people in the inbox. So now you're having a real conversation, but guess what? My email is actually going to show up. 
So not only it's like that's half the battle is a lot of emails don't even get to the inbox because you swipe left and deleted it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's even if you saw it, half of them are probably in the promo tab on, on Gmail. So it's, it's, it's kind of what we did from a core anyways, but it also does work as a, a tactic, you know? So one thing that I want to point out as well is on your website. Um, if you go to your, your golf club website, you have a pop-up that's a spinner that like enter your email address and you yeah. get, 10% off or you get this or whatever. And that is another unique approach for gathering the email in the first place. I've never seen that before. And I, and I just wanted to point that out as something that stand at, stand it out to me. Yeah. It gets like 18 or 19% often. I mean, we're, I, I'm pretty unemotional with, with like certain aspects and, and email gathering is, is like a necessary evil, right? Like you got to get the email <clears throat> to market to them. And that is, is a, is a, what do they call it? Uh, gamifying, you know, cause like, dude, people, you know, to give their emails kind of a big deal, you know, and even bigger now with privacy and stuff and people really don't want to be just blasted to. So that helps us just get, you know, out of the gate, more opportunity, more emails, more opportunity to market to them. And if we're doing a good job, they turn into customers. Yeah, I love that. Well, and just, I, I didn't want to interrupt, but I did want to just kind of pile on to Mike's comment um, about just, you know, these conversational emails versus sort of the pre-programmed thing, because I think that there is a, a stereotype, I guess, when it comes to uh, email marketing, that everything needs to be sort of generalized for a broad audience. And, you know, so you end up with these kind of really broad or, well, maybe focused, but a marketing message, right? You're hit up with some kind of, you know, a pitch or a sale or a product or a service or a whatever, right? But it's never just information gathering or conversation or something. So I think that that is an interesting tactic, you know, despite sort of the, you know, the other benefits, you know, the fact that it might end up in an inbox and that sort of thing. But I do think that that's an interesting tactic. That well, said, you also made the point that email is your only owned asset. And I think we've heard something like this before, but do you mind sort of elaborating on that idea? That idea? So like, for example, versus social media, how email is sort of superior. Yeah, I mean, this is the, the biggest shift was 2016 when Facebook throttled your reach on your page. So like our page, I think has 130,000 likes on Facebook, which is our core channel. And I think it was 2016, they're like, hey, we're going to pages, business pages are not going to have as much reach. So literally, we would have posts. I remember this. We did a post that got like 10,000 shares, like just crazy numbers back in the day. And then when they did that, it went down. <laughs> We'd have some posts get like three likes. Yeah. yeah. And we did the same thing, not to give away all my series. We now do a lot of questions on there to get engagement. Um, but essentially, that was a big, you know, kick in the butt to say, hey, you're on Facebook's turf. You do not own your followers, right? So, like, before I could post, like, hey, we got a new product drop coming. Or, hey, how you guys doing? And get, like, tons of replies and actually drive revenue. Now that it's it, it got throttled, if I have an external link, that's almost not going to get seen. Mm -hmm. so, so the likelihood of my post now driving, I think that year alone, when they throttled it, my social guy was like, dude, we, because of this change, we lost $800,000 of revenue just because organic would drive almost a million dollars just from organic. Um, we now have, you know, we do engage best we can, but it's not owned. It's not guaranteed if I make a post, they're going to see it. So with email, we own those emails, meaning any given time or day, I can send them without having to pay. You know, it's like we have to pay at run ads to send to them. You know what I mean? Like in an ad platform. And we actually own that asset. So that's really like, that's what you own, your customer list and your email list. That's the only thing on this whole thing. It, like, because if you stop Facebook ads tomorrow, your traffic's gone. You can't mm -hmm. just blast your whole thing because you have no reach anymore. So, so that's how we look at it. It's the most important thing you have um and it can be squandered and wrecked pretty quickly so it's it's one of those things where you need to take the time and really you know put the effort in and and believe in it but for some reason i, I don't know people have lost the uh, meaning of email 
Well, no, I, I love that. And I think it's a great observation because I, I think, you know, email feels like the old thing, right? And social media feels like the new, cool, hip, whatever thing. And, uh, you know, there's a, a phrase that I've heard, you know, a bunch of times in a bunch of different ways, but the idea is that if the product is free, then you're the product, right? So in the, in the case of Facebook or social media platforms, that sort of thing, right? I mean, they're collecting your data They're you know, maybe if you're engaged with ads, you're, you know, you're spending money with them, all that sort of stuff. But I think it's a great observation or just a great point to sort of, you know, put an exclamation point next to that, you know, when you're engaged in somebody else's platform, anytime somebody else owns the platform, you know, it can change overnight. And in your case, I mean, it was an $800,000 a year expense when they change their move, you know, or, or change the site or when they update the algorithm or whatever, right? Because you optimize for one thing. And then when they switch it up, something else happens. And so I think that that's a really good like SEO too, not to derail, but it's like, if you're on Google's terms and you're ranked number one for golf clubs, and they have a penguin update or some algorithm and you're on page 20 now, all that traffic is gone. So I think that's how I look at it. And, you know, email is the core. That's what you own. Take care of it. That's your, that's your business. And then you have all these different spider, I don't know, spider webs, but extensions that drive traffic. Mm-hmm. And those, you know, whatever drives traffic, Facebook, Google, SEO, um, TV, whatever your channel is, you want to get their email on and you want them on ideally to be a customer, but once you get them there, then you want to sell to them again, you know, and, but you have to earn that right, you know? Yeah, no, I, I think that's a great observation and something, you know, uh, good to be pointing out for our audience. Can you maybe break down your hierarchy of what you do? So obviously emails on top is Facebook and Instagram second and SEO third and, and so on and so forth. Well, they're, there... almost, they're, they're almost different things. You know what I mean? It's not like they're stackable and like, they're all just, it's like a bicycle wheel and they all are like the emails in the middle and then you have the spokes and you need all of them to, to ride your bike. Okay. So like for me, like the core things we always do. And then we have like a testing spoke where we try different shit and it will work or will not. But like Facebook, Instagram, Google, that's our traffic, right? All day, every day. That's what we spend money on. That's what we drive traffic with. Um, and those are ads. And then we've got organic, which is, if you were to stack those, it's like ads are more important than organic. Organic is straight for engagement. It doesn't drive revenue, but it is important for engagement. Ads, you have to figure out how to buy, buy traffic profitably. So it's above that. Um, and then you have like, what's the other ones? My, I have it by agency. It's like CRO, which is how well when someone gets to your site, do they convert? And then you have SEO, which is just how well do you, you find your search? And then you have your email. I don't think I did that well, but it's like all those could together allow you to be successful, but not one is, you need them all, I guess. You can't just do one over the other. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, on your LinkedIn profile, um, I noticed a, a term that I hadn't heard before and it's Cla- Clavio, that you're a gold oh, yeah. certified Clavio agency. Can you tell us what that is? Yeah. So for econ brands, I mean, Almost every client or e-com store I talk to is already on it, um, but it's just the best in class e- ESP or email service provider. So that you can segment, send your email, you know, you can see how much revenue you drive there. Um, so essentially what we do is on our agency, we go into Clavio, we have our copywriter and team, they write your emails for you, you approve them, we send with Clavio. Um, that so that it- was a game changer back in 2000. 17 or 16 when you could segment like that was the first eight or agency or esp where you could segment out because before i would send an email and be like it would be like a driver deal be like coupons not applied for previous purchases (laughs) and people would be like i just bought it today you're not going to apply this coupon to me so now we can segment i mean they do nine million other things as well but you can segment out on what they bought, you can build flows, and it, all it does in the day, it's a platform that allows us to drive more revenue and engagement. So, like an average cost client of ours will do, you know, we like to double. Like they're doing ten percent of revenue from you, and like them twenty percent, but most are doing thirty to forty-five percent, and just allows you to then, if you do the back end well, then you can pay more for traffic. You can scale up more. Okay, so it's essentially like a Mailchimp on steroids. Yeah, exactly. There a lot of the other uh email platforms are trying to now come out with features but they're the first like e-com specific best in class i mean every every e-com brand that's over a million for the most part is is using it nice 
Yeah, no, I love it. And in fact, I would just sort of add to it with my experience with Clavio. Um, they, I mean, it's really easy to, you know, even if maybe you're not a, at $2 million a year in revenue and we can't employ your agency, it's easy enough to use as a individual to, at least for basic purposes, it'll, it will build forms for you. You can build little landing pages. You can, uh, create some simple automations and stuff, even with like a basic plan. And, uh, yeah, no, it's a, it's a great tool. I've used it for a couple little startup ventures that I had hoped to kick off and, uh, and yeah, that's a great tool. Nice. So. so cool. Well, so as we're sort of uh, winding down here, kind of getting to the end of things, do you have uh, any sort of, I guess, parting shots? You know, let's say we've got a, a little e-commerce store. We don't know yet that we need you. Maybe we don't have quite a, enough revenue to really engage with an organization like yours, but maybe we're getting up there. Do you have any pointers, anything you might be willing to share that would help sort of, I guess, nudge an e-commerce company along the way a little bit? And then that might uh, sort of help them or, or provide the insight that they might need help, you know, in, in which case they could maybe delegate to an organization like yours. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the same uh, hypothesis we've had for the conversation, which is have conversations that you care about at scale. You know what I mean? Whether it's social, whether it's email, whether it's in your ads, whether it's in your Facebook group, whatever you're trying to build or, or sell to, don't assume you know what your client wants or customer wants, because a lot of times you're going to be wrong. So I, I would ask questions about products, what they like, what they don't like, who they are, just to learn more. And I think that would help find a better product market fit than you'd be, that would actually allow you to scale. Because if you do have product market fit and really know what they want and really know why they're buying and because you ask those questions, you can then use that in your CRO, your Facebook ads to then spend more. Because really at the end of the day, to become a seven, eight figure, I haven't hit nine, but uh, e-com brand, you gotta be able to buy traffic well, and you can't buy traffic well if you don't have product they want, and if you don't have offers that convert. And the best way to do that i found is to ask questions and continue that forever and you'll be fine. Love it. I love uh, it. Tyler, can you tell people where to go if they wanna reach out and find you, maybe buy a golf club? <laughs> yeah, yeah, please buy some clubs. Uh, no, so if you're golf, bombtechgolf.com. And if you're an e-com store owner, ecomgrowers.com. Or if you wanna to talk to me, I'm on LinkedIn fair, fairly frequently when I'm not throwing my phone in the trash for a week at a time. Um, <laughs> at Tyler Sully Sullivan. Excellent. Nice. Well, cool. And we'll make sure to include all those links in the show notes. So thank you so much, Tyler. Really appreciate your time. Great conversation. And uh, we learned a lot. Appreciate it, guys. Absolutely. And thanks so much to everybody who tunes into the show this week and every week. And we'll see you all next time.